Okay, hello folks. This is a question, a multiple choice question from the 2010 Specialist Maths VC Exam 2, uh, question 22, and it's a bit of a tricky one, so I'm going to do a quick video explaining uh, how to tackle this question. So let's read it. A particle of mass m is moving in a straight line under the action of a resultant force f, where f is this, given by this function of uh, x, x being the position along the line. And given that the velocity is v0 when the position is x0, and the velocity is v1 when the position is x1, it follows that which one of these is the relationship between all of those things. And these look pretty mangled and nasty, and so I'm going to try and uh, attempt to show where these come from. So first up, we have a question involving force and position and velocity and all that. We're probably going to need to use some kinematic differential equations to tackle this. Um, and this is where um, all those different ways that you learn how to write acceleration, they come in a lot of handy here. Uh, so first of all, we can use Newton's law to write um, this relationship here as a equals uh, f as a function of x divided by m. That's just f equals ma, but rearranged. So this basically gives us a as a function of x. And now with a as a function of x, we can realize that you know we could get a differential equation out of this and maybe solve for velocity or position um, if we write a in a different way. And this is the way we're going to do it. So a is actually the same as dv dt by definition. Using the chain rule, that's dv dx multiplied by dx dt. And we know that dx dt is just uh, v, just velocity, by the definition of velocity. And so we can rewrite this as dv dx times v. Um, OK, and so actually, we can write acceleration as dv dx times v. And we're going to do that. In fact, I'm going to write it like this instead, v times dv dx. It's the same thing. Uh, so that is equal to f of x uh, divided by m. OK, and so now what we realize at this point is that we've turned this uh, equation into a separable differential equation. It's separable because we have um, this dv dx thing going on, and we have everything else in terms of x's and v's. I know there's this f and this m, but um, but they're constants, basically. This f is a function and this m is a constant. Um, it's x and v that are the variables that are going on, and f is just some function of, of that x. That's the important part. Uh, it doesn't really look like a separable differential equation because normally a separable differential equation would have if we divide both sides by v, it would have the v over here. And you say, well, this part is a function of x, and this part is a function of v, and they are separated by a multiplication, so it's a separable differential equation. But um, actually, we don't need to worry about that, because um, we've already had the separation done for us. The v has already been moved over to this side, which is normally the first step in solving one of these. That's already been done for us. So it's, it's a separable differential equation that has actually already been separated. So usually the next step here is to integrate both sides with respect to um, this variable down here, um, the, um, in this case x. And what that will do is we get a nice change of variables happening on the, uh, on the right side, sorry, on the left side. Over here we get a nice change of variables happening, uh, and this just becomes the integral of v dv. The problem is that we can't integrate, well, that would let us integrate this side, dv dv. Uh, the integral of v dv is really easy to integrate, but over here we have f of x dx, there's this m as well. We don't really know what f of x is, so that's going to be hard to integrate. And so what I propose is that we're going to bring in our um, initial conditions here. And basically, it's the case that um, if these integrals are the same, then they're also the same if they were definite integrals. For example, if we had x0, that is x equals x0 and x equals x1, and the same over here, x equals x0 and x equals x1. So if we give these integrals terminals, it's not going to change whether they're equal or not. If they're equal in the first place, they would definitely be equal with the terminals as well. Uh, okay, so now we just have to be a bit more careful when we do this change of variables, because uh, the terminals are also going to change variables. And what they're going to change is from x equals to v equals. But we know that when x equals x0, v is equal to v0, and, and then the same for x1 and v1. So that will be an easy change of variables for us to do. So it becomes um, v0, v1, this is v equals now. Uh, of v and then dv dx, dx just becomes dv. This is very easy to integrate this side. Uh, and on this side, it just becomes x0, uh, x1, um, f of x over m dx. And this is starting to look like the kind of things we have over in these options. So we're getting closer. All right, so now um, we could maybe do some manipulation of this to move this m uh, fraction. It seems to be outside of the integral in a bunch of these cases. Uh, but maybe we'll leave that till we move this around a little bit more. Um, OK, so we can do this side. This is just a definite integral of something in v. We know how to integrate this. It actually just becomes um, it actually just becomes a half 
v squared, evaluated at v1, and then evaluated at v0. Um, and that is equal to this thing. Um, and I'm going to do this expansion now, because this just becomes a half v1 squared minus a half v, uh, v0 squared. And that is equal to the integral from x0 to x1 of f of x over m. Yeah. And so now this is starting to look very close to some of these over here. In fact, all of these have v1 as the subject, so that's, I guess, the next step is to solve for v1. I'm going to do a little bit more space, so let's, uh, let's make a little bit more space. And we'll come back to look at the options when we have an answer. All right, so let's get v1 by itself. We're going to have to first add this to both sides, I guess. Uh, so we'll get half v1 squared equals this integral uh, f of x over m dx, and then plus a half v0 squared, uh, if we multiply everything through by 2, that will have the effect of getting rid of this half over here, but we're also going to have a 2 now at the front here. And then there's a square root that's going to happen over this entire thing. So v1, I mean, really plus or minus, but um, that's not in any of the options, so we won't worry about that for now. Take a giant square root outside of, I'll take this opportunity to take this factor of 1 on m outside of the integral, because that's how it appears to um, be coming up inside these options. And we get 2 on m outside of this integral. And then this inside here is just f of x. And we still have this plus v0 squared on the inside. OK, so I'm going to grab this work down here. Hang on, let me grab the entire thing here. Um, and cut that move back to our options. And then maybe we'll be able to select the correct one. Hang on a second. I'm having some trouble pasting this. Um, but it was, it looked like it was this one. Um, because all the others don't really stack up. This one doesn't have the root m going on. Uh, this one looks almost right because we've pulled out the root m, but we don't have the square root on. On this side, we've broken up the square root over the plus, so I think this one is, is correct. And just, yeah. Um, so that is the answer. There was a couple of tricky parts to that question, but um, but I guess um, once you've seen the working, it's it's not so scary. Um, the, this was a tricky question, though. I, I don't know how many people got it right on the actual exam in 2010. I would say this was one of the harder questions on the exam. The tricky step being this one here, I guess. If you don't um, realize that you can use this information in this way, um, it becomes very difficult to tackle this question and get to the right answer. There we go.